I have a lot of dentists reach out to me that are interested in becoming practice owners. Oftentimes they're primarily just wanting to figure out, does it still make sense to become a practice owner? What was your experience like? So I sat down and I made a list of the 18 most important things that I've learned during the process of buying my practice. If you can remember these 18 things, you are gonna be off to a really good start. My name is Chris, I'm a dentist. I've worked multiple associate jobs, but I've also been an owner of my own practice. I now spend a big portion of my time helping dentists become practice owners. So let's get into the list. The first thing you're going to find out when you become a practice owner is that the first six months are going to be extremely stressful. I'm not going to lie, when I first bought my practice, I don't know if I've ever been that stressed in my life. Where you go from being an associate where you just show up and work to being the owner of a practice where you're responsible to make sure things happen, it's a big jump. Was it worth it? Well, my income more than doubled. I was able to go from working five days a week clinically to working three days a week. I felt substantially more respected by the patients, the staff, and other dentists than I, than I did when I was an associate. I no longer had a boss and I was able to be in control of the office and set things up the way that I wanted to set them up. So was it worth it? It was absolutely worth it. There's no way I would ever go back to working full-time as an associate when I know that I could become an owner. Being an owner is so much better than being an associate. Pretty much anything in life that is valuable is going to take some work to get. Hard work is not a bad thing. Some of the happiest times in my life have been times where I've been working really hard. I've often thought about, what would it be like if someone offered me, you know, $100,000 a year, but the requirement was you're not allowed to work. You're not allowed to volunteer. You're not allowed to be involved in anything that helps other people. You can't do anything that could be considered work. Only entertainment and spending the $100,000 and living a, an average life. I would absolutely not take that offer. Overcoming challenges and doing work that brings value to other people, that's what makes life meaningful. From a physiological point of view, stress and excitement are actually the same thing. A heightened neuroepinephrine response in which your body is prepared for action. You're alert, you're looking around. It's simply the way that you choose to frame that sensation, which determines whether it's a good or a bad experience. Transitioning from being an employee to being the owner of a business, it's going to be stressful, but it's also going to be exciting. You're going to be learning all sorts of new things, things that you didn't even know you were going to have to learn. It's going to be stressful and it's going to be exciting. As stressful as it was, I actually look back really fondly upon the those initial few months of when I was buying a practice and when I first became an owner. It was just so exciting having a clear goal and being able to do things that measurably bring you closer to that goal. The next thing I learned is that the value of a practice is not determined by the production of that practice. Oftentimes that's the easiest thing to measure and so we'll use the previous year's revenue when we're determining the value of a practice. But the thing that actually brings a practice value are the patients that are in that practice. It doesn't matter if the dentist before you was some superstar dentist that was doing all these crazy procedures. What matters is what are you going to be able to produce at this practice. The more patients that you have on the hygiene schedule, the easier it's going to be to fill your production schedule. As you get more experienced and better at treatment planning, you might be able to handle a practice with fewer patients because you'll be treatment planning more per patient. But especially starting out, you wanna to try to see as many patients as you can. The more patients you see, the more work you treatment plan, the more work that you're gonna have on your schedule and the higher your personal production numbers are going to be. Next thing is that practice brokers are not always going to be honest with you. To be clear, there are a lot of really great practice brokers and I recommend that you work with every single practice broker that you can find in your area. They're each gonna have different practices listed for sale, so you wanna make sure that you're reaching out to all of them. You just need to keep in mind that anything the practice broker tells you put it through the filter that they are working for the seller of this practice and they're going to get paid a percentage of that sale price they're paid on commission so they are going to be incentivized to sell a practice to you even if it's not the right practice for you just this week i met with a dentist who had a practice that a practice broker convinced him was an amazing practice to buy but when we actually looked at it we figured out that this was 100% the wrong practice for this dentist to buy, but it was the only practice that this practice broker had for sale at the time. And so he tried to convince this dentist that it was right for him. 
but it was not. Listen to what the practice broker has to say, ask lots and lots of questions, but just keep in mind that the answers that you get back to those questions are going to be biased. Every practice has issues. You are never going to find a perfect practice. When you are running a business that's doing a million dollars a year plus, there are going to be some mistakes that were made. You're not going to find the perfect practice in the perfect area that you want to live that meets every single expectation that you have. It's just not going to happen. You're going to have to make some some compromises when you buy a practice. Now, the good thing is, once you become an owner, you can make changes to this practice. Now, I wouldn't recommend trying to make too many changes starting out, but over time, you can turn this practice into a perfect practice for you. Keep an open mind. Be open to the idea that maybe your initial plan wasn't actually the best plan. Maybe there are other things out there that you didn't know about. Try to be as flexible as you can. Just make sure that you're aware of any deficiencies that a practice has and that you're taking those deficiencies into account when you're making your projections. So you might have to buy some new radio equipment. You might have to set up a new practice management system. You might find out that the, the lead assistant is going to be retiring when the dentist retires and you're going to have to hire a new assistant right away. There's going to be some issues. There's going to be things that you're going to have to work through. Just be flexible and figure out what those things are so that you can be prepared. Talk to the staff of the practice before you buy it. Ask them as many questions as you can because they're probably going to be telling you some things that you weren't aware of. The people who know this practice best are going to be the people who work at that practice. While the seller of the practice and the practice broker are incentivized to have this sale go through, the staff and the team that work at that practice generally don't have any financial interest in seeing this transaction go through. They are more interested in making sure that the owner that takes over after the seller is going to be a good fit for this practice. So they are going to be very honest with you about things. So don't be afraid to ask a lot of questions to the staff. You also want to try to get an idea of who's going to be staying around after the transition. Are any of the team members related to the selling dentist? If the dentist's spouse was the office manager for the practice, that can be a little bit of a tricky situation because chances are the spouse is going to be retiring and leaving at the same time the seller leaves. When I bought my first practice, I found out on the first day of ownership that the office manager had accepted a job at another location. There was literally nothing I could do about it. I didn't even know this office manager yet. She just had an offer and she just decided to take it. That was very stressful and made my life extremely difficult starting out. Try your best to find out if the office manager, if the hygienist, if the assistants, if they're going to be staying after the transition. Transition. Can you keep up with the production of the selling doctor? This one seems pretty obvious, but you'd be surprised how many dentists forget about this while they're looking at practices. Look at the production per procedure report and see if the selling dentist is doing any type of procedures that you either don't do or don't want to do and see what percentage of the office production is based upon those procedures. No two dentists are the same and you're not going to be exactly like the seller, but if you come in and are not able to do a lot of the procedures the selling dentist was doing, chances chances are you're overpaying for the patients that you're going to be receiving. There's a lot of different ways to value practices, but one of the ways that we sometimes look at practices is you're going to be paying for the first year's expected returns per patient. So for instance, let's say a practice has a thousand patients and the production per patient is a thousand dollars per year you might be paying somewhere around a million dollars for the practice. This is a very rough estimate. It's more complicated than that, but this just gives you an idea. If the seller was able to produce $1,000 per patient per year because he was doing a bunch of specialty procedures. If you come in, you might only be able to produce $500 per patient. So for you, a practice that has a thousand patients is worth $500,000. For the selling dentist, that practice is worth a million dollars. Ideally, you wanna find a practice where the patients are worth three or four hundred dollars to the dentist and they're worth a thousand dollars to you so that you can buy a practice for three hundred four hundred thousand dollars but then you grow it to become a million dollar practice within a year. Don't buy a practice from a prosthodontist or an endodontist or an oral surgeon if you're a general dentist. If you buy a practice where the seller had been getting referrals from other dentists or been doing these advanced procedures that you're not going to be able to do, you're going to be overpaying for the practice relative to the value that you're able to bring to those patients. Patients don't care about fancy dental equipment. When you first buy your practice, you're going to have all sorts of dental supply reps and equipment brokers coming in and trying to convince you, oh, these chairs 
repairs are old, you need to upgrade. Oh, th this looks so bad to the patient. Because you as a dentist know a lot about dental equipment and have seen lots of different models, you think that, well, this chair looks old to me, therefore it's gonna look old to The reality is, unless the chair is just in really, really bad condition, it's probably fine and the patients couldn't care less. You probably don't need to spend $100,000 on brand new dental chairs when you first start out. If anything, if there's some things that need repaired, you can find someone to help you repair things for a few thousand dollars. Your time and money is probably gonna be better spent on painting the walls, getting some new decorations, maybe changing the chairs out in the waiting room, maybe redoing some things on the front desk, hire a company to come out and just clean everything super well. Those types of things are probably gonna be a lot more noticeable to patients. When you're first starting out, you're gonna be just fine using air-driven hand pieces. You're not gonna need the expensive Cavitrons. You can find an inexpensive piezo. When I bought my practice, I needed some new hand pieces and I was looking at what it was gonna cost to get set up with an electric system. It was gonna be like, 20, 30, $40,000 to outfit the office with electric hand pieces. But I bought a pack of, I think like 20 air driven hand pieces on eBay for like 50 or $60. They worked fine. Patients never noticed. There were never any issues. The hand pieces worked just fine. And yeah, occasionally they would break, but I would throw them out and I'd buy some more. If you try to send your hand pieces off to some repair, person, that can cost more money than just buying new ones. You don't need fancy equipment to provide high quality care to your patients. Later on, as you get more experience and you start making more and more money and you become more established, you might decide, hey, for, for the sake of my wrist, I prefer the electric hand pieces because I can apply less torque on the burrs. That's fine. At that point in your life, once you've figured out what you want and once you've saved up some money, if you want to spend twenty, thirty thousand dollars on some new hand pieces because it makes you happy, great. As an owner, you get to do that. You might decide, well, hand pieces aren't that important to me, but having a good quality dental chair for me to sit in is really important. Maybe you want one with armrest. Maybe you want one with extra cushion. Maybe you want one that rolls. Maybe you want one that doesn't roll. You get to decide those types of things, but don't fall into the trap that starting out, you have to buy all this new equipment and you have to have all the fanciest stuff. The reality is, is you can just get started with working with what you have and you'll start to add things on over time. You realize what's actually important to you and what's not. The first practice I bought had 11 operatories and I had an equipment guy come in and talk to me about getting new chairs. To get new chairs for this office, it was gonna cost like $200,000 or something to get the nice ADEC chairs. I only paid like $300,000 $50,000 for the practice. I had one of my friends come in who's a dentist who's been working longer than I have and he took a look at the chairs and he said, Chris, they're fine. Are they fancy? No. Are they the best chairs I've ever seen? No, but the patients are not going to care. They're going to get the job done. There were a few that needed fixed. I hired a repair guy. He came out. I think he charged me like seven, eight hundred dollars He took a day to go through and he fixed all the chairs and I was good to go. Now, the one piece of equipment that I would buy is an intraoral scanner. I found that the returns on using an intraoral scanner, not only is it easier to do, but you don't have to pay for nearly as much impression material, the lab bills are cheaper, it's quicker to send off a scan than it is to mail off an impression, it's less work than having to send things through the mail. I would just get an intraoral scanner day one, not even worry about impression material except for dentures and, and certain unique cases where you need it. You don't need a CIRAC and a mill, all you need is an intraoral scanner, they're not that expensive, 100% I would recommend that on day one. Probably the most important factor that you're going to need to consider before you buy a dental practice practice is the location. While basically everything else about a practice can be changed over time, location is going to be the most difficult aspect of a practice to change. Your practice is probably located somewhere in the center of where most of your patients live. And so if you buy a practice and try to move it 15 minutes down the road, for some patients it might be closer, but for others, they might be going from driving 20 minutes to get to your practice to now driving 35 minutes. And that might push them over the edge to say, well, I'm just gonna find someone who's closer to me. When you buy a practice, you need to be prepared to stay in the area of where you bought that practice. You're probably gonna need to stay in that office for at least the first year or two until patients are used to you. But I know of quite a few dentists who have bought a smaller office. They only sign you know, a two or three year lease and then 
Sometimes as soon as they bought the practice, they might get started on either finding or building a new building that's across the street or fairly close by. And then eventually they open up the new building. They're able to migrate all their patients over to it. The patients are happy to go to a new office. They're excited. It's a new building. It's right across the street. They've seen it being built while they've been coming to the old office. If I was going to do a startup where I wanted to build my own building, this is the strategy I would follow. I would first buy a practice that's in an older building. I would sign a shorter lease and then I would start my startup across the street and migrate the patients over. You need to know the lease that you are signing inside and out. You want to be very careful that if there's any chance that you're going to want to be moving across the street or moving to another office sometime within the first few years, that you don't sign a 10 year lease and then you're stuck paying for two practices. Ideally, you want to sign a lease that has a short term, but also gives you guaranteed options to renew that lease. Now, if you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're not going to want to move the office, it's all right to sign a longer lease. If this office that you're at has expansion potential and you really like it and you know you're going to be there long term, it's all right to sign a longer term lease. Also, when you sell a practice, most leases are transferable. You want to make sure that it is. Generally, it's not a big deal to have the buyer of your practice assume that lease. Not every patient is going to like you when you take over the office. You are probably a very different type of person than the seller. You're going to have different interests. You're going to have different personalities. Maybe there were people who liked the seller and for whatever reason, they don't like your personality. They don't like you for whatever reason. There's nothing you can do about it. One third of people are going to like you no matter what you do. One third of people are going to dislike you no matter what you do. And then there's a third in the middle that could go either way, depending on how you act. So best case scenario, even if you're the nicest person in the world, chances are only two thirds of people are going to like you. You're still going to have that one third that's going to dislike you no matter what you do. So don't sweat it. There are going to be some patients who move to other dentists and don't stay with you during this transition. That's part of the process. But you're also going to be getting some new patients. You're going to be getting people who wouldn't have gone to see the previous dentist, but they're interested in seeing you and so you're going to be getting new patients it's all going to balance out just do your best to try to make sure that you're acting somewhat similar to the seller. If for instance, the seller was extremely talkative and spent tons of time in the room with the patient and you come in first day and say hi and then walk out and spend almost no time with the patient, they're going to say, well, this guy wasn't very friendly. My last dentist was so much more friendly. But at the same time, if the seller before you was really efficient and came in and got the work done and got out, but you come in and you want to sit around and chat and, and you take forever to get your procedures done, they're going to say, well, this new dentist is so slow. The last dentist was quick. Some like to work fast and get in and get out. Some like to come in and, and hang out and talk to the patient. There's nothing wrong with either way. You just want to kind of get an idea of what the dentist before you was like, and then you want to make sure that you're not being too different from what the patients are used to. Having the right office manager at your practice is going to make a huge difference in the quality of your life. Like I said earlier, when I bought my first practice, the office manager left day one, so I didn't have an office manager. I had to hire an office manager right away, and I was in kind of a hurry to find someone because the other person left so unexpectedly and I, I was new to this and I had a lot of things on my plate. So I found someone who said she had done the work before. I didn't really question her too much because she seemed legit. So I hired her to do this role and she worked for a few months. And then I started getting complaints from patients because they were getting bills from their insurance company. It turned out that a lot of the patient's insurance plans had waiting periods where they couldn't do procedures like crowns for the first six months. But the office manager that I hired didn't actually understand that and didn't realize it and hadn't been telling patients about this. And so we had done a whole bunch of crowns that weren't going to be covered by insurance and the patients were super upset about that. I then realized that I had hired an office manager that didn't have the level of experience that she led me to believe during her interview. Make sure that when you hire people that they're able to actually do the tasks that you're going to be requiring of them. When you already have three or four people up front and you hire someone new, the three or four people that are there can help to train that new person. But when you're starting out and let's say your office manager just left and you don't have really anyone up front, then you need to make sure you hire someone who has experience, who's done this job before because there's going to be no one up there to teach them how to do it. Don't 
be afraid to overpay a little bit to get a good office manager in place because it's going to make your life so much easier to not have to worry about what's happening up front. I later found an office manager who had been doing this for 20 years and she had a huge amount of experience. Yeah, I paid her a little bit more than I had previously, but it was 100% worth it. She brought so much value to this practice. Having a good office manager is extremely important to your quality of life and the quality of the patient's experience. Patients stay during a transition because of the hygienists in that practice. If you have a hygienist that's been seeing these patients for the last 10 years, when the doctor leaves and you take over, the patients are still going to be coming because they are familiar with that hygienist that they've been seeing. While in the long run, I would say having a good office manager is the most important position in a dental office. When you're doing a transition and you're first starting out, the most important employee in the office is going to be the hygienist or hygienists. If you get on this hygienist bad side and she goes and works for the dentist across town, across the street, there's a chance that she's gonna bring a lot of her patients with her. So you wanna do everything you can to make sure that that hygienist is going to be staying after you take over the practice. You don't wanna lose those patients and you don't wanna to have to do your own hygiene. So make sure that you have a solid hygienist. I would even go so far to say that if you found out that a hygienist was going to be leaving after you purchased the practice, that might be a reason to not buy that practice. That is how important a hygienist is to the transition of a practice. After you make an offer on a practice, you're going to have a period of time, usually a month or two, where you're gonna be able to look at all the documents of the practice. You're gonna have a chance to come into the office. You're gonna look at all the equipment. You're gonna look at the patient records. You're gonna look at the radiographs. You're gonna look at every single thing in this practice to make sure that what you're buying is what you thought you were buying. Do not take this lightly and do not just believe the thing that the practice broker or selling dentist have told you. I have seen cases where practice brokers and sellers have straight up lied about things, have straight up tried to hide things from the buyer. If you're not extremely careful, you might end up with a practice that's nothing like what you thought you were buying. This is definitely not something you should do by yourself. You need to be hiring advisors to help you through this process. You're gonna want a lawyer to look at all the legal aspects of this practice. You're gonna want an accountant to look at all the financial aspects of this practice. You're going to want another dentist to help you look at all the clinical aspects of this practice and you're going to want some sort of equipment rep to go through and look at all the equipment in this practice. Don't think that oh well I, I hired a lawyer therefore everything's good or I, I have an accountant therefore all the financials are good or oh I talked to my friend he's a dentist he said everything's good. You need to make sure you have multiple people who are specialized in those individual areas taking a look at this practice because while one person might miss something another person might spot something. No single person especially you, is going to be able to recognize every single thing in this practice. You're gonna want multiple eyes on this, multiple people looking at it, because if you make a mistake during this part of the process, it could end up costing you millions of dollars later. Be prepared for a transition time after you buy the practice. If you buy the right practice, you are gonna be able to make substantially more money than when you were working as an associate. The only thing though to keep in mind is that there's going to be a transition period when you're moving between an associate and owner role. When you first take over this practice, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you are not needing a huge amount of money from this practice. You wanna have a certain amount of savings saved up so that you don't have to pay yourself for the first few months of owning this practice. Especially if you're taking insurance, sometimes it takes insurance companies a little while to send you the first paycheck. You're gonna have a few extra expenses up front. Maybe you're doing some remodeling, maybe you're getting some new equipment. Just be prepared that you might not make any money for the first few months of being a practice ownership. That's completely normal, that's fine. I didn't pay myself anything for the first five months of practice ownership, but then by the end of the year, I had made more than double what I made as an associate. It's very normal. Just be prepared for a little bit of a transition time that is expected. Yes, you can take vacations during your first year as an owner. Don't think that just because you have a new practice that you're not gonna be able to take time off you're gonna have time to take off. It's a necessity that you still take breaks. Running a dental practice is a marathon, it's not a sprint. During, during my first year of ownership, my wife and I, we went to Egypt, we got to go inside the pyramids, we went to Greece, we went on a cruise, we took a trip to Chicago to visit family. We actually went on a second cruise later in the year. My wife really likes cruises, so we did a lot of traveling. When you own your own practice, you can take off as much time as you want. You're in control of your schedule. You might have to figure out how it's gonna work with 
with your employees when you take time off. There are a lot of strategies of how you can handle that. We're not gonna get into it right now, but you can take vacations as a practice owner. Smart buyers hire advisors. We already mentioned this in the due diligence section, but you do not wanna to try to do this alone. Generally, knowledge can be categorized into four groups. Things you know, things you know that you don't know, things that you don't know that you don't know, and things that you think you know, but you actually are wrong about. The second two are the ones that you need to worry about. You're a dentist, you, you're smart, you've learned a lot of things. Chances are you've spoke to other practice owners, so you have an idea of some of the things you don't know. But when you actually get started, you're gonna realize there are a ton of things that you didn't even know existed. There's gonna be insurance credentialing that you didn't even know about. There's gonna be certain types of taxes that you have to pay that you didn't even know there was such a thing as state franchise tax, blah, 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 blah. You didn't know that you had to have a diagnostic code sent to this insurance company in order to have it approved. You didn't know you needed a predetermination period for this. I bought my first practice one year after I graduated from school. And so obviously there were a ton of things that I didn't know, a ton of things I knew I didn't know, and a ton of things that I didn't even know I didn't know. So I actually hired a practice coach to help me out. I think I ended up paying him like twenty dollars to $30,000. It was 100% worth it. Did he do all the work for me? No. Could I have got by without hiring him? probably, but in my case, there were a few big changes and big things that I just wasn't even sure how to handle. I already told you about the office manager that left day one. There were just a lot of things that I didn't understand and having someone who had done this before show me and help me and give me guidance on where to get started, that was invaluable. Not only are you gonna be the owner of a business, but you're still gonna be the dentist, the clinician working in that practice. So you need to be able to focus your time on seeing patients, even though there's a lot of other business things that you need to figure out. Especially during the first three to six months, that's when it can be the most helpful to have an advisor helping you out, showing you the things that you don't know about, making sure you're getting your insurance credentialing stuff figured out, making sure that the systems you have set in place are going to be helping you out in the long run, helping to answer questions that come up because there's going to be a lot of questions that come up along this process. And that leads us to the last point, which is prepare to learn along the way. You're never going to be ready to be a practice owner. When you're working as an associate, there's just so many things that you're not going to have experience doing that you're not going to even know about. Certainly try to do your best. Make sure you're reading through as many practice reports as you can. Try to hang out some at the front desk, talking to whoever's doing insurance, kind of asking about what they're doing, looking at the notes that they're sending off to insurance companies, kind of looking at scheduling, seeing how things are run. You might find some things that you think they're doing great that you want to you want to keep for your own practice. You might find some things that you say, why are you doing it that way? I can do it better. You have some ideas. That's good. You're going to be able to improve. You're going to be able to take a next step further beyond where you were before. In the first month of owning a practice, you're probably going to be learning more things than you learned in the entire last year or two working as an associate. It's going to be stressful, but it's also going to be exciting knowing that the actions that you're taking are helping you get closer and closer each day to your goals.